Welcome, ladies, gentlemen, Borgs, chickens, and things to episode seven of the Muppet Trek podcast. I'm Steve. And I'm Jarman, and we are here to compare and contrast and confer about our two favorite franchises. And what are those, Steve? The Muppets and Star Trek. We have been doing one-to-one reviews of The Muppet Show and Star Trek, the original series. And this week, we have Muppet Show special guest Florence Henderson and original series Star Trek episode, uh, What Are Little Girls Made Of? That doesn't sound creepy at all. Right. No, it doesn't. (laughs) Uh, So let's talk about the guest this week. Florence Henderson and what she's in a little bit of context. Uh, she's the mom from the Brady Bunch. Yeah, the original one. And what would our generation know her from? The mom. She's the, the mom Brady from Bunch. the Brady Bunch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I did look through her IMDb, and well, Florence Henderson. It's unfair to say she hasn't done anything else. She has had a very long career. She has. She of course got her big notoriety on the Brady Bunch, and has since gone back and revisited the role so many times in so many different ways. Mm. That that's sort of what she will always be in everyone's mind, like commercials and other sitcoms and stuff and, and Brady Bunch reunions. Yeah. And they, they had their own variety show and they had a traveling music show for a while. Um, but, you know, like that, that's the thing. She is always going to be the mom from the Brady Bunch. I know what's kind of funny is I just recently happened Carol. on the Internet uh, to see the first appearance of Jim Carrey on the Johnny Carson show. Mm-hmm. Um, this is back in like 1990 or something before, right before Johnny Carson retired. And the first guest was Florence Henderson and he was the second guest. So he comes out to a lot of applause, doing lots of wacky dances and stuff. And he sits down and he goes, Hey Johnny, is there any, uh, lipstick on my face? He's like, uh, no, why? And he says, Oh, just, uh, Florence Henderson was backstage and they all start laughing. <laughs> so I <laughs> thought that was a great way to start it off. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, this episode, uh, the show opens up with the bouncing Borsalino brothers from Boston, who are like a p- acrobatic pig act yes. that brace themselves for this human, this pig pyramid that ends with the biggest member getting on top, the pyramid collapsing, and the floor also colla- collapsing. And they didn't do any bouncing, following, which is strange. <laughs> yeah. Following this, we get a find ourselves backstage where Kermit asks George the janitor to fix the floor. George complains and Kermit suggests he quits and to which George replies, what? And get out of show business, which I thought was really, really funny. That was cute. Uh, next, we get talking homes, oh. which contains a really lame joke about someone's house being haunted. And then a reference to America's 10 most haunted, like instead of 10 most wanted. Oh, I didn't was, get the joke at all. <laughs> it was really lame. Uh, we get our first Florence Henderson number, the elusive butterfly where she's, a woman chasing butterflies through like a foggy ethereal forest. It's okay. <laughs> Shortly after this, we're backstage. Kermit re- raises his voice uh, while yelling at the Borsalino brothers, which really turns piggy on. And, and then she sexually assaults him. Yep. <laughs> we then find ourselves at the dance where the best joke is when a loud female whatnot screams about her engagement after her partner gives her permission to announce it. Mm hmm. Uh, following this is the talk spot where Kermit and an, a really overt, overtly flirting Florence Henderson have a conversation. Piggy walks in on it. Florence turns it around and says that Kermit was practicing all the things that he wanted to say to Piggy on her. Piggy then leaves. Florence go back to, fr- to flirting. And then Piggy comes out and just viciously attacks Florence Henderson. <laughs> yes. And knocks over Kermit in the process. Afterwards, Rolf the dog sings Cobbleston Pie, a lovely little song with nonsensical lyrics. Uh, next, we have the panel discussion where they discuss if Shakespeare was really bacon, Francis Bacon, uh, but Piggy doesn't understand and she gets really terribly offended. Uh, and then she calls for all the pigs of the world to unite and the bouncing Borsalino brothers come in. They try to do their act again and it fails again and they fa- <laughs> it collapses because they're pigs as well because they're pigs. Backstage again, the Borsalino brothers coming off the stage from the top from uh, the panel discussion just won't shut up. And Kermit tells them to knock it off. And this turns into this game of telephone of people telling them to knock it off. And then him saying to knock off the knock it off. And they say knock off the knock it off until he finally loses it <laughs> and screams knock it off. 
Uh, Kermit, finally fed up, yells at Piggy, who once again is turned on by his like assertiveness, I guess. <laughs> Disturbing. <laughs> Next, Fozzie goes out and does his comedy act. He does a bunch of impressions, but they're really all just the same thing. Just his voice. Uh, and the, at the end of which, Statler and Waldorf uh, request an impression of a bear leaving the stage. <laughs> uh, following this is our closing musical number, Happy Together, where Lizard comes out and tells Florence uh, that he's, he has a big thing for her, and then all these other frackles come out, and they all sing Happy Together. Uh, backstage one last time, Piggy is still jealous. Kermit makes yet another bacon joke, and Piggy just karate chops the crap out of him. Uh, we get a very quick moment with Florence and Sweetums, where Sweetums uh, says that he f- is falling over her, and then he literally falls face forward. <laughs> uh, then we get a weird throwback, yes. uh, a pre-recorded sketch that was actually in the Valentine's Day special. One of the pilots. We were on the planet Coosbane, and we're about to witness the Galio hoop hoop. Um, it is a great sketch. I still really enjoyed it. I forgot that it was here, so it was strange to see it again. Yeah, because when if you guys go back and watch our pilots episode, this was in one of those, and so they just kind of yeah. stuck, uh, copied and pasted basically. Uh, and then the show ends with a sign off. Fozzie tells a terrible uh, prop joke involving a wire hanger, and that's that. That's it for the episode. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, we'll get uh, into so it in a little bit. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, the factoids, which for the most part I have are uh, the music from this. So elusive bot butterfly uh, was a song written by a guy named Bobby Lind, who was a folk singer. And this was his biggest hit hitting number five on the U S uh, charts. And it was in part inspired by a poem by Yates mm. called the song of the wandering Angus. <laughs> okay. Uh, next we have Coddleston pie. Um, Ralph explains its origins in the episode that it's from Winnie the Pooh and it was written by A.A. A. Milne. Um, he was a poetry writer and playwriter who was popular, but then he wrote two Winnie the Pooh books and then two other children's books and it overshadowed his, the rest of his career to the point where he resented it. Mm. He really felt, felt pigeonholed. His son, uh, Christopher Robin, uh, was, was the namesake of the main boy in Winnie the Pooh. He grew up resenting his father for exploiting his childhood and became horribly estranged. This estrangement was only further distanced when Christopher Robin married his cousin. Oh, which then further divided the family. And wasn't that movie recently with Ewan McGregor about Christopher Robin, the actual person? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Weird. I think, (laughs) uh, and then we get happy together for, uh, originally performed by the turtles. Uh, there are two founding members. One of them was this guy named Mark Volman. And anytime they appeared on TV, he would play an instrument that wasn't in the song. Huh? So in multiple occasions, while all performing happy together, he used a cello, a trumpet, a piano, and a French horn (laughs) and all these different shows they did. And, uh, it was his subtle objection to lip syncing, but that's just how they did shows at the time, but he hated it. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, Jarman, what what did you think of this episode? Um, it was a little disappointing. I think I tell by the tone of your voice describing it. I think you might feel the same way. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Uh, yeah. Her first number happens. And it's like, is this just a showcase of Florence Henderson? Because it's just her by herself walking through this forest. There are no Muppets. It's just her by herself. Um, and has there been a guest yet who doesn't sing? Or does that just not happen? Uh, eventually there must be. Yeah, because saying like she can tell she's not like a professional trained singer. She can sing really well. Um, she does okay. Yeah, yeah. She reminds me of like the way grandmothers sing in the choir, and you know, like if you're in a church or something. It's, yeah, kind of big round vowels and hollow yeah. sound and that kind of stuff. It's I like if your it. grandma was singing. Um, and there was just a a lot of the repeated uh, assaults by piggy on Kermit were getting a little old. I was just like, come on, play off a little bit. (laughs) It didn't, it didn't go up and down. No, there was just, just a constant. Every time it started the same way. She loves him. She loves him. Then she beats the hell out of him or sexually assaults him. Um, so I was like, Whoa, okay. All right. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, and then it's just like, I don't know, Florence Henderson. It seems like a lot of the episodes too, are if there's a female guest, they're just every Muppet has a crush on them. I'm wondering if that will. He, he, yeah, that's an easy <laughs> thread to pull. I feel like it is. Yeah, they could I get it. 
that's like kind of missing from our last episode about Paul Williams. It's like there's so much about these hosts that they could delve into beyond their appearance. And, and instead, they just make short jokes the whole time. Yeah, they made short jokes about him. All the female guests, it's about how beautiful or, or hot they are. And it's like, come on, there's a lot more to these people than just these subs, like these little, you know, surface things. So that was getting a little frustrating. And just that Florence Henderson is just, she's the mom from the Brady Bunch. And that's what she's got. And there's, she's not that much more interesting to me, you know? Um, yeah, you, you read my tone correctly, I would say. <laughs> this, it felt like such a throwaway episode. Elusive Butterfly could have been on any TV show. Right. There's no, no like, Muppets in it at all. And even the butterflies weren't Muppety enough to make it a Muppet thing. Like, that could have been anywhere, and I wouldn't be able to say, oh, that's from that episode of The Muppet Show. I will say a couple things I did like um, uh, real quick is that I liked yeah. the, the talk show segment about the Shakespeare and Francis Bacon because I was like, that's a deep cut. And I love that was my, clever. I love my Shakespeare stuff. That was really cool. Um, I love Ralph's song with about Winnie the Pooh, the the nonsensical song. I really like I just love Ralph so much mm-hmm. that I, I enjoyed that song. Um, but yeah, those that those the two things. It's the highlights, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Coddleston Pie, um, which is one of it, it's funny that back to back we have two episodes that have two of my all time favorite musical numbers. Mm. Um, old fashioned love song in the prior one. And then Colston pie. Uh, this is being performed by Jim as Rolf, the dog. Um, and this was one of Jim's favorites. Uh, and f- at Jim's memorial, uh, as Fozzie, the bear, uh, Frank Oz sang Coddleston pie oh. in memoriam to Jim. And it is a lovely touching song. And, and he does a very good job paying tribute to his friend. So because of that, it also has this deep place sort of in my Muppet heart. Right. So it still has some kind of thing that punched through. Um, but that's for me, Cuddleston Pie is like the one reason to watch this episode. Otherwise, it's a throwaway. <laughs> that's real. That's, yeah. You're not missing too and much. And mix that in with the pre recorded sketch from Coosbane. It's like they were just throwing like, this one in. Or, or, you know, they had limited, my, the way I kind of imagine it is they had probably had limited time with Florence Henderson because mm. she was very popular and very busy. And so they're like, okay, we have her for three sketches. Yeah. And we have to make a, a whole show out of her only being able to be in three sketches. And she's popular right now. So we have to give her a song all by herself to make her happy. We're right to assage that personality. <laughs> right. Um, so now I, you, you read it absolutely right. This is at the bottom of the heap probably so far for me. Yeah. And I was looking forward to it. Cause I was like, Oh, Florence Henderson. And then I'm like, no, Florence Henderson. <laughs> oh, Florence Henderson. <laughs> Uh, well, let's move on to hopefully better things. Jarman, tell us about the original episode, uh, the original series episode we listened to. Uh, yeah, it's called What Are Little Girls Made Of? Uh, which, you know, the song, What Are Little Girls Made Of, My Love? Okay, so we start off with the Enterprise going to a distant planet to search for Dr. Roger Corby, who is actually the fiancé of Nurse Chapel, uh, played by Majel Barrett, mm-hmm. the current lover at the time of Gene Roddenberry. He was cheating on his wife with her. But she is her pretty much only episode of the original series that focuses completely on her, kind of her story, basically, um, even though it's not all about her. Uh, but her fiancé has gone missing for a long time. He's had no radio contact, so they're checking out to see what's going on on this planet where he was last. Uh, when they're at the planet, Corby finally responds to them on the radio and requests that only Kirk and Chapel beam down with no one else. They thought it's a weird request, but they trust him, so... They go down. He's like a famous doctor published in a lot of things. He studied at Starfleet. Um, when they get there, Corby is nowhere to be found. It's just uh, there's no one around. So Kirk is suspicious. So he asks two security detail to beam down as well. So they start traveling down to the cavernous base of the planet and they run into Corby's old assistant, I think named Brown. Um, and he seems to mm-hmm. barely recognize Nurse Chapel and he's acting very strange, which they also find odd. But then they hear a scream and it turns out that one of the security detail fell down in the cavern. But we see as the audience, there's this giant, weird alien looking guy who actually knocked him down over the edge. Um, so Kirk's like freaking out over this. He radios the other security guy and says, hey, keep a lookout. If we don't you know, call back after a certain time, make sure we have more security come down. But before um, the, he can, the security guy can tell the Enterprise that he gets killed by the large alien guy as well. And the large alien guy you might recognize uh, from the original Adams Family TV show. He played Lurch on that show, which uh, he's very recognizable. Um, so they finally go down with Brown, who is the assistant to Dr. Corby, and he takes them to Corby. And once Corby sees Chapel, he he just is overcome with love and kisses her and misses, so much he misses her. And he apologizes deeply for Kirk losing a crew member. So things seem to be getting better. And suddenly an incredibly attractive and very scantily clad female comes out and says her name is Andrea. 
and she's heard so much about Nurse Chapel, but Nurse Chapel is very visibly jealous that this weird lady who's half naked has been hanging out with Corby this whole time while he's been missing. Uh, so Kirk is still uneasy, so he con- wants to contact his ship, and when he wants to do that, Brown, the assistant, pulls out a phaser and says, and is saying you can't go anywhere. Kirk eventually shoots him, and they are all stunned to see that Brown has circuits for guts. He's actually an android. And at that moment, the large alien-looking dude comes in and stops Kirk from leaving. Uh, Dr. Corby explains that this planet was long ago inhabited by an advanced race, and they made androids. And the large guy is one of those old androids that was left behind by this old race. And Corby's now perfected this technology, and he can make his own androids. So Corby wants to show Kirk how it works. So he makes an android of Kirk uh, with his body and with his memories. And they put him on this big turntable thing and spin him around, and that somehow makes <laughs> makes an android. Um, Kirk still worries that something bad is going to come out of this, so he implants a response in his memory as he's being copied into an android by repeating this phrase over and over again while being duplicated, and it's basically like an insult to Mr. Spock. He just repeats it over Mm. and over again. Uh, So Corby explains that he wants to put all human souls into android bodies to cure them of disease and aging, but also reprogram them so they don't feel bad feelings, only joy and happiness. So he wants to basically recreate um, humanity and make them all into androids and reprogram them himself. So Corby sends the android Kirk to the Enterprise to basically find out where they're going. And so we can find a nearby planet to start trials on this planet, this soul uh, removal process. And Spock is surprised to see him and he hasn't heard from him in so long. But then android Kirk says the insult to Spock that the real Kirk implanted within him. Um, And Spock is suspicious enough that he eventually was going to go down with security and find out what the hell's going on. But in the meantime, Kirk uh, screws with the mind of Ruck, uh, the big, large android dude, which you'll find is an ongoing theme is Kirk is really good at uh, confusing computers and robots. He's it's, this comes back a lot Ooh. in the series because <laughs> he's so smart. He can confuse the smartest robots. And he finds out that the old race of androids actually killed their biological masters. So he convinces the large android to turn on his Dr. Corby because he's actually a, he's just like his old masters. So kill, Corby uh, kills Ruck the big android guy to defend himself. And at that point, Kirk tries to overtake Corby and in their scuffle, it's revealed that Corby is also an android. Apparently the real Dr. Corby was dying on the planet and had to replace himself with an android body. Um, And in that moment, Andrea, the, the hot Android (laughs) female uh, discovers that she also has emotions and tell Corby that she loves him. And as they embrace her phaser goes off and it disintegrates both of them and they both die. So in that moment, Spock arrives and he finds them all alone and when uh, he asks the doc- where Dr. Corby is, Kirk says he was never here. So that's the the end of the episode. Quite a lot going on in that one. <laughs> it's very complicated. Oh, yeah. So a couple little trivia factoids here. Uh, this is the only original series episode to prominently feature Nurse Chapel, as we mentioned before. Uh, she would later on go to play Luaxana Troy in The Next Generation, where she has an ongoing character that's fantastic. And she's just a really underrated actress in the series. She's really good. Um and it's funny because eventually her character, Troy, in Next Generation, is accompanied always by her servant, uh, who's played by the guy who plays Lurch in the new Adams family. So she's always around to Lurch, basically. <laughs> ah, interesting. Yeah. And uh, apparently the replicator turntable thing that turns you into an android uh, is in a very famous Star Trek blooper reel, which I need to find, which shows a bunch of the cast members totally drunk using it as a merry-go-round. <laughs> which is hilarious. <laughs> That's awesome. Um Apparently, and this is a very famous episode in a lot of memes as well, because at one point when Kirk is running away from Ruck, he breaks off a stalactite from the uh, ceiling and he's it holding totally it. It looks like a dick. And it looks like a dick. It totally looks like a dick. <laughs> it totally. And immediately <laughs> stops. He's like, oh, that looks like a dick, right? It's like, yeah, that looks like a dick. And you'll find memes of that all over the Internet. Um, so and also this is a historic episode of the episode because Crewman Matthews, the guy who falls over the edge, is the first official red shirt to be killed in the series. Um, okay because earlier right. yeah earlier in this crewman have been killed but they've not been wearing red shirts so he's beamed down he's the first red shirt it's history right there huh and a red shirt's like because doesn't scotty typically wear a red shirt yeah red shirt is um engineering and and like uh security uh that like kind of operations operations kinda? yeah that's kind of a good word for okay. it uh and blue is science and um and medical and then command is in a yellow Okay. That's what we officially get to once they figure out all the colors they've been screwing up the let's past. Say, let's say get it all sorted out. Four episodes, yeah. Uh, yeah, because you'll notice that Ahura is in her nice red outfit this time, and she'll stay that way from now on. So, Okay. Yeah. So what do you think of this episode? 
Uh, I really liked, you know, honestly, I think Ruck, uh, played by Ted Casty, was the best part of the episode. Oh, okay. He was such a centerpiece and did such a good job with it, I thought. He has an IMDb page a mile long. Mm. Um, but really, I, I love the fight choreography with Kirk. It was a bit overdone, but still super impressive how he could just throw Shatner around. And it didn't seem like there was any wires or anything. He just lifted him off the ground with ease. <laughs> no, and they did a lot of the, the, the effects very smartly where like even when he threw Shatner, he threw him, he clearly landed on a pad. And then they had someone quickly remove the pad and Shatner backed into a corner while the camera panned. And it implied that he threw him so hard that he like skidded across the floor. Right. But they the didn't wall. show any of it. It was very cleverly done. Um, I did like Nurse Chapel, uh, her getting a, a, a stronger look mm-hmm. um, and her sort of confronting herself. And later on in the episode where the doppelganger of Kirk, the robot Kirk unbeknownst to her asked her like would you do, uh, obey disobey an order or direct order if i gave it to you and she's oh please don't let me make me make that choice it was interesting to see her be torn and also have intelligent dialogue and not just be like oh poor woe is me woman and like a lot of the characters can yeah. she was um, just a very strong character yeah so i really appreciated that things i had maybe a problem with um so I need you to give me an estimate here. Like what percentage of the original series is just a doppelganger episode? <laughs> There's probably about so far, we're two more. About 50%. <laughs> 50% of the episodes so far feature some sort of doppelganger like element. I can think offhand of about two or three more uh, in the rest of the whole series. Okay. So I think we've gotten a lot of them out of the way already. <laughs> okay, good. The premise is getting real thin and it made me worried for the rest of the season. <laughs> we'll have evil version of Kirk and then we'll have a female who switches bodies with Kirk. And so that's the two we have left. I think they're far apart. So, okay. I feel better now, <laughs> but, but as soon as I was like, Oh my God, copies of people again. <laughs> yeah. Understand. Um, yeah. I, I really, and I thought, um, Shatner, I guess I was about to say Kirk, but I, guess, I think Shatner did a really good job balancing them out. And after seeing him going from the last episode where it was like good Kirk and evil Kirk, it was good to see him kind of play like just two kind of marginal versions of Kirk. Don't forget about evil blanket. <laughs> yeah. Evil blanket, <laughs> evil radiator. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was nice to see after such an overblown version in the last episode we watched. Yeah. More toned down subtleties. That's right. He is capable of that. <laughs> All right. So before we move on, I've got some Trek connections for these episodes. Whoa. Uh, Florence Henderson was on three episodes of Fantasy Island, whose lead was Ricardo Montalban, who played Khan. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> a true. A prominent Star Trek villain we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, for a very short time, the Brady Bunch and Star Trek shared a studio space. And one day Florence Henderson came in late and didn't have anyone to do her makeup. So she went over to the Star Trek makeup room and did her makeup sitting between Shatner and Nimoy, who both ignored her. Oh, that's funny. Um, and to mention the Brady Bunch was the first production um, done by Paramount Television after its acquisition of Desilu Studios, which is how they got Star Trek. Ah, uh, Okay. So the Brady Bunch was their first outing as Paramount Television. They're related very closely. That's right. So, Jarman, let's talk some similarities between these two episodes. All right. Uh, well, first one I got, oh, they're kind of connected. So I'm just going to do mine together if you don't mind. Yeah, do it. Uh, there are similarities about learning what love is and dealing with jealousy. It's important. So uh, Chap- okay. Nurse Chapel is nervous about what the relationship is between Dr. Corby and Andrea just like Piggy is nervous about the relationship between Florence Henderson and Kermit. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I actually wrote both feature female jealousy. That's true. There and you go. both Miss Piggy goes back and forth between kissing Kermit and hitting him, just like Andrea and Captain Kirk. <laughs> Absolutely right. I didn't catch that. Because <laughs> one time Dr. Corby says, Andrea, kiss Mr. Kirk. And she kisses him. That's- She's like, now strike him. Now strike him. <laughs> she strikes him. You see, there's no emotion. There's no love. Oh, she's an android. She can't feel these things. <laughs> so, yeah, they both do that. Uh, so mine, uh, in, 
in the at the dance, the female whatnot is super excited about her engagement. And in the original ep- series episode, they're looking for the nurse's fiance. Oh, perfect. Uh, both feature f- someone falling through the ground or floor, the acrobat pigs and the <laughs> random red shirt who got pushed down that shaft. <laughs> That's hilarious. And I've got one more. All right. Uh, a f- and you kind of touched on this. A female assaults a male who spurns her advances. Oh, this is true. Piggy to Kermit and Andrea vaporize, vaporizes that Kirk and Troy when he says he won't kiss her. <laughs> yeah, like that a was second, so abrupt. a second afterwards. So she goes, "Kiss me," and he's like, "That's that not logical." Really logical. <laughs> <laughs> that was so good and so random. I was not expecting that. I'd forgotten about that part. Oh, oh man! Oh no! What's that? Whoa, whoa! I hear something strange. Transporter malfunction. Transporter malfunction. All right, it's the time of the show where we take one character or actor from one of the episodes and transport them to the other episode, uh, making it fit somehow. <laughs> so, what you That's got for right. us, Steve? So this week, I would have Ruck, the kind of big giant guy, go over to the Muppet Show and replace Sweetums in that that cute little moment with him and Florence Anderson. You asked a lie except that for, moment too. <laughs> except for the cold android is it, it's him like as a cold android not understanding the turn of phrase i fall for you you fall for i guess i could do that and then him just pitching forward <laughs> i put that's one of my moments i put the same thing <laughs> twice yeah two two episodes two, in a row we've done that all right my uh, other one is that, uh bouncing boy Salino brothers from boston uh uh-huh. i'm gonna have them replace corby's androids uh, cause they're going to be the beginning of his Corby's Android army. Cause they all look alike. Uh, and they're all like, okay. identical. And I, like <laughs> I said the, the bouncing Borsalino brothers come over and replace Ruck, except for they all are constantly like wearing a big trench coat and trying to get in that pyramid position. <laughs> but then as Ruck, they just continuously fall apart through the episode, <laughs> but they're like trying to Muppet man it. Oh Yeah. I like, yeah. <laughs> I like how we didn't talk about this. We had, we had very similar transporter malfunctions. Very similar. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's pretty man. funny. That was um, great. So that brings us to the end of episode seven of the Muppet Trek podcast. Join us next time for episode eight of the Muppet Show with special guest star Peter Ustinov. And original series episode, Miri. So from the lovers, the dreamers, and us. Live long and prosper, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Muppet Trek podcast. Be sure to follow us on social media on Facebook and Twitter. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. This podcast has been brought to you by A Play on Nerds. <laughs>